So hello everybody, this is Bhante Joe here, and just here in Sri Lanka, uh, near, uh, the, near the Chivra Kuti, my friend's uh, Kuti, and thought to record a short uh, Owada for the internet. So I thought that maybe you could start with just a little bit of meditation, so maybe you could lean forward a little bit and arch the spine, and look about three feet in front, and close our eyes. And can focus in on the breath, can know when it's coming in, <clears throat> and know when it's going out. If we breathe in a long breath, can just know I'm breathing in a long breath. And if we breathe in a short breath, can just know I'm breathing in a short breath. And can focus in on the breath at the tip of the nose. And if notice any patterns of tension or tightness around the nose, around the face, can just let those relax. And can practice breathing in and out from this area at the tip of the nose. And when breathing in and out from the tip of the nose, can be helpful to change one's perception of the breath. So that it's not just air that one is pulling in and out of the lungs but it's a kind of energy that's all around and coursing through the body. And it's possible to pull it in and out from all directions. So on the in-breath, one can breathe in, pulling in breath energy from all directions. On the out breath, one can breathe out, exhaling breath energy in all directions. And before we finish meditating, can spread thoughts of goodwill, wishing may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And can make the mind infinite, can make it unbounded, all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond, in every dimension. May all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease.
Okay, and can open eyes and do a short reflection on the Dhamma. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang chami dhammang saranang chami sangang saranang chami Tatiampi buddhang saranang chami tatiampi dhammang saranang chami tatiampi sangang saranang chami Tatiampi buddhang saranang chami tatiampi dhammang saranang chami tatiampi sangang saranang chami So I hope that everybody is having a great day, uh, wherever it might be in the world. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of very nice uh, here in uh, in Sri Lanka. It's maybe about uh, 25, 26 degrees. And as you can see in the middle of the of the forest here, um, there's some beautiful kind of natural scenery. And so yeah, so last week uh, did um, a little dhamma discussion. So this week thought to try an awada. And so, uh, yeah, often here in Sri Lanka, one of the interesting things is that there's this real uh, strong culture of solitude with meditation. And, uh, you know, in the, in the Buddhist texts, in the canon, one of the things you often read before somebody achieves enlightenment is he goes, you know, he uh, uh, alone, withdrawn, heedful and, ard- ar- ar- heedful and, uh, and uh, ardent and resolute, something like that. Uh, that's the kind of preface they have before he attains uh, Nibbana. So it's, a, it's like a stock phrase that gets repeated. And so in the, in the time of the Buddha, in the time of the Ken, you could see the monks would go to their kind of various dwellings and they would uh, practice there alone. And, uh, and that's, what they would, uh, that's what they would do. That's how they would meditate. There's actually this sutta which describes kind of the behavior of a monk. It says kind of he, he goes and wanders and finds the root of a tree. And then he kind of sits there, meditates for the night. In the morning, he, uh, he goes out uh, and uh, goes for alms. And when he comes back, he comes to the very same tree <laughs> and continues on with his uh, meditation practice. There's a portion there where he sleeps too. Um, I can't remember if it's, if it's in that exact sutta. But in any event, it's this kind of uh, lifestyle where the monks go and live uh, relatively solitary lives. And then in the time of the canon as well, they would come together, uh, you know, usually every two weeks. And every two weeks they would, uh, if, you know, if not more often, but uh, every two weeks they would have a recital of the Pati Moka rules, the uh, monk's rules. So you get this image where monks would, uh, you know, perhaps kind of uh, as a baseline lifestyle, uh, be living alone, practicing meditation most of the day, um, and coming together once every two weeks uh, in their practice, you know, not as a hard and fast rule, but as a kind of, uh, you know, perhaps kind of like a, you know, general, generalish standard. There's also uh, uh, cases in the canon where they talk about monks living cell by cell, and these different kind of lifestyles. But in any event, uh, you know, this does seem to be something that's really highly emphasized in the canon, is kind of finding uh, places and time to practice in solitude. And this kind of thing about practicing in solitude really goes against the grain of, uh, of society, really goes against the grain of what uh, most of the time value is placed on. So I remember when I was in high school as a young man, <coughs> and uh, you know they had these people who were like a cool, and then they had people who were called losers. And, <laughs> and the people who were cool had a lot of friends, and the people who were losers didn't have that many friends. They didn't go to that many parties didn't go to uh, whatever else, you know, that's, that's the term they apply. The people who are cool, uh, had a lot of friends, maybe a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of attention and went to a lot of parties, these various kind of things. So in the Buddha's, uh, in the Buddha's kind of uh, way of uh, practice, the way that he recommends, we're actually going against the grain of what, a lot of what society desires. It's not just the case in high school and uh, in uh, adult life, people who go on the most vacations, have a lot of good connections, have a lot of money. These are the people uh, that get a lot of attention, people that other people look up to. But the things that are good for meditation and the things that are good for praise 
aren't always things that go in the same direction. They don't always kind of uh, uh, line up and go exactly uh, running the same way. In fact, there's this sutta where the, or there's this Dhammapada verse where the Buddha says uh, um, that it's basically only for his ruin that gain comes to a fool and ravages his bright fortune and rips his head apart. And he says, the path to Nibbana leads one way, the path to gain's offerings and fame leads another. So knowing this, one should kind of put aside gain's offerings and fame and cultivate seclusion instead. So when a person comes to a kind of secluded place, which uh, you know has been very extremely impressed, uh, it's been very impressive to see these kind of opportunities that are here in Sri Lanka, and the monks are uh, practicing alone, and kutis widely separated, you know, made kilometers apart from uh, from one another, and sometimes many kilometers from the main meeting place, practicing meditation. And this kind of lifestyle that, uh, that the Buddha advocated goes against the grain of gaining more friendships, of gaining more status, of gaining more uh, fame, gaining more kind of uh, uh, homage. It kind of goes against the grain of these things because when one comes to a forest alone, all those things aren't there. It's kind of like the type of lifestyle that people would <laughs> you want to push away, run away from, you know. Uh, kind of you don't have a big house, don't have a big car, don't have praise, you know, don't have all these uh, various things. But what this lifestyle allows one to do when one goes to a place of solitude, when one goes to a place that's quiet like this, that isn't kind of uh, thronged with a lot of different people, um, then the Buddha's recommendations for going to these kind of uh, places is that it allows, uh, it, it allows one's mind to settle down. And so, you know, usually when one's mind launches out to gains, offerings, and fame, to status, am I a winner, am I a loser, am I cool, <laughs> am I going to this party, am I not going to that party, then, uh, then a person's mind becomes agitated with these things. And it's kind of like somebody's mind shooting out. You know, it's kind of often not even aware when a person is, uh, you know, shot out to these kind of things. A person is often, can often be unaware even of what's going on in the present moment, can't notice what's happening in the present moment because one's thoughts, one's mind is tied up with these gains, offerings, and fame. But when these kind of things, gains, offerings, and fame, externally one turns away from them, comes to a place of quiet, then basically one has no choice except to try to look for happiness uh, outside of those things, try to find a happiness that's inside. That basically kind of forces you to, <laughs> to look inwards to try to find something value, you know, to try something, find something of value uh, with the resources that one has inwardly because the external ones aren't there. Okay, you know, people aren't, uh, you know, hopping out and, you know, praising you left, right, and center for, <laughs> you know, for your dwelling or, you know, you're not getting invited to any great parties and, uh, you know, you're not getting, uh, you know, phone calls, you know, five times a day to invite you out to lunch or to whatever it is. What you do have is a lot of free time. You have this kind of time where a person can devote themselves to meditation practice. And all of this turns a person inwards. So this is what a person, this is one of the reasons why the Buddha recommended this, is because when the mind shoots out to this kind of thing, am I a winner, am I a loser, am I cool, am I not cool? It's kind of like the mind kind of plays a bit of a magic trick sometimes. You know, oftentimes people suffer from things and don't see why it is that they're suffering don't see how come they're suffering, don't see where the suffering comes from. And part of this is because the mind has gone out. Uh, when a person is creating the causes for suffering, their mind isn't there watching. When those causes ripen, it isn't there watching to see how they ripen, to see what they come from. And this is called delusion. This is what uh, causes people to keep running back to things that cause them to suffer over and over again without letting them go. It's not seeing the drawbacks of them, not seeing the dangers of them. But when a person comes to a place of quiet, these external things fade away, then one basically has no choice but to turn inwards, to turn inwards to watch where are the causes of suffering in my own mind? You know, where is the escape from suffering in my own mind? And when one turns to look to these things, that's where one tr truly l learns to look to find a refuge in the Dhamma, in the Buddha's teachings, and to see where it is. Because whatever it is that's external, this is one of the important things that the, the Buddha teaches, whatever kind of, whether one's a winner, whether one's a loser, whether one's a, you know, going to a lot of parties, whatever it is, all these various kind of things are all subject to change. And this is one of the things, like last week we were talking a bit about uh, clinging to the past. 
this is one of the things when a person has a really great time as a winner or, you know, whatever, a really cool person in high school or in work life, then when those things change, that's when a person becomes somebody who's clinging to the past, somebody who can't let go of the past, somebody with regrets for the past. So it's for this reason that the is to come back, to, uh, to go away from the external world and to try to find uh, peace and happiness inside, to try to detach our mind from these things. Because to whatever extent a person grabs onto something is to that extent they suffer when it changes. But coming to a place where it's quiet, coming to a place where there's not a lot of disturbance, whether it's uh, one can kind of get some, uh, you know, some quiet room in their house, <laughs> spend some time alone there, whether one can go out to a forest, spend some time there, or one can go visit a monastery and spend some time there. Wherever it is that a person's mind has this kind of opportunity to turn inwards, that's where they can get to see what it is that's causing them to suffer. That's where they can get to see what it is that causes them to be happy. That's where they can try to get rid of this delusion, this delusion that's like a kind of magic show. So that when suffering comes, oh, where did it come from? Why is it here? How can I get rid of it? I don't know, you know? Uh, when happiness comes, when run, you know, kind of runs out to grab onto it, whatever external thing it may be, you know, kind of never seeing the cause of these things, never finding something that's better than them, never finding something that goes beyond them. So it's for these reasons that uh, places of solitude are real places of benefit. And kind of, uh, it's not what the world craves. The world doesn't crave solitude, doesn't crave quiet places, doesn't crave peaceful places in general. Uh, the world tends to praise material gain, tends to praise status, tends to praise praise, <laughs> tends to praise pleasant feelings, and suffers when these things change. So when one comes out to places like this, one has this opportunity to try to find something that lies beyond them, to try to see the cause and effect relationship between what it is that makes one suffer and why one can't let it go. And all this is for the hope of developing a peace within one's own mind and for developing the discernment that allows one to see the causes of suffering and put them to an end, to try to find a peace that's true. Okay. So I think that leave that for reflection and hope that everybody has a great day wherever it might be and wishing you all the best till next time.